Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Two important stories on the show tonight. The coronavirus outbreak, how hospitals are preparing for the growing emergency. Election day is right around the corner. How much will coronavirus concerns affect turnout? The Dow plunges 13% as concerns over the economy exacerbate. Plus, I visited some restaurants and grocery stores to see how they were coping with new restrictions and supply shortages. But first, just a few minutes ago, the last of Chicago early voting sites closed ahead of tomorrow's primary election. And Chicago elections officials say they are seriously concerned about not having enough election judges to operate smoothly. Anyone under 60 who's healthy, who hasn't traveled, if you're home, working from home, if you're back from college and you have the time, please Please heed our call and volunteer. Help us. Commissioners say the steady trickle of judges calling in to resign recently turned into a torrent today. However, many Chicagoans have taken advantage of early voting at the city's 51 locations. More than 12,000 voters cast their ballots in just five hours this morning. But there's still concern about why Election Day is proceeding amid fears over the spread of coronavirus. Our Spotlight Politics team will have much more on that later in the broadcast. Today, the state of Illinois announced the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the state is up to 105 across 15 different counties. Meanwhile, the state of Illinois driver services offices will be closed through the end of the month starting tomorrow, so expired driver's licenses and vehicle registrations will be extended 30 days. That news came late this afternoon from the Illinois Secretary of State's office, and in just a couple of hours, all Illinois bars and restaurants will close to dine-in service. Governor Pritzker says many of them have been understanding of the changing rules. And they understand we are in a very serious moment in the history of our state and our nation and that people need to make sacrifices and, and they, are, um, they understand that this is part of what their duty is. And starting tomorrow, Chicago Public Schools will join every public and private school across the state of Illinois in shutting down for at least the next two weeks to stem the spread of COVID-19. This afternoon, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and school CEO Janice Jackson toured a CPS command center staffed with CPS employees to help students and families figure out where to pick up free meals and answer questions about other district services. Today's visit comes as a couple of other CPS schools were closed a day early because of confirmed coronavirus cases. People recognize um, that we are taking these seemingly drastic measures in order to save lives. We have looked at um, the arc of this virus um, in terms of what happened in other countries. Um, we were al al walking along the same path, for example, as countries like Italy. And the city's top doctor, Allison Arwady, is starting a new way to communicate with the public about the novel coronavirus. The Chicago Public Health Commissioner is taking questions from the public in a live streamed Q&A session on Facebook and Twitter at 11 a.m. daily. Residents can tweet using the hashtag AskDrArwady. What is social distancing? Yeah, so social distancing is a term that basically means being aware of how close you are to other people to help prevent the spread of disease from person to person. When we think and you can find out what else Dr. Arbody addressed on our website, wttw.com slash news. As for the weather, tonight mostly cloudy with a low around 36 degrees. Tomorrow, gradually clearing skies with a high near 51. Many of the social distancing measures Illinois is taking a part of an attempt to flatten the curve. More people will get coronavirus, but the aim is to prevent a sudden spike in cases that could overwhelm health care facilities. Amanda Vinicky spent the day learning what facilities are doing to prepare. Amanda, how are they doing? Brandis, information about the novel coronavirus, just how long it sticks to services, what, if anything, can be done to cure it, to prevent it, that's all ever evolving. There's no way a hospital could have prepared for this exactly, but the chief medical officer at Rush University Medical Center says the hospital has done simulations and drills in preparation for something like COVID-19. The challenge is no one asked for the global pandemic to come to their neighborhood. Um, and really, that's what we're here to do is to be able to serve our communities, take care of people when they're sick. So we're trying to do everything we can to plan, stay ahead of this and make sure that we can take care of people at capacity, both locally at Russian throughout the city. 
To that end, Rush has made changes to its regular operating procedures. For starters, anyone who isn't feeling well is encouraged to call before going to the doctor or hospital. Increasingly, Rush and other hospitals are holding virtual telemedicine appointments. We use our video visit platform on rush.edu where patients can get a video visit consultation from home so they're not at risk of exposing themselves to other things nor at risk of exposing staff, other patients to things as well. Here's a photo of Dr. Casey consulting with an infectious disease specialist via video about a patient suspected of having the coronavirus. This is an example of limiting exposure to someone face to face. But let's say you do need to go to the ER. Rush has a different setup now. This is called forward triage. If someone arrives with a fever, cough, shortness of breath, they go into a special waiting area through tents that are set up in what's usually the ambulance bay. Chairs are in this special waiting room. They're spaced far apart. Medical personnel wear protective gear. From there, if you do need to be seen in the emergency department, we move you back to what, what's called, we call it our negative pressure pod. Um, but it's a pod where the air doesn't mix with the rest of the air in the hospital. It's independently exhausted outside. Um, and that's really out of an abundance of caution. Amanda, that's at Rush. What about other hospitals? I also visited Northwestern today, or the lobby anyway, because for obvious reasons, we can't get into medical areas where patients are being seen. Dr. Benjamin Singer is a physician in the intensive care unit. It's has treated COVID-19 patients and is expecting more. We are seeing new cases pop up in Illinois every day and in Chicago. And so we think that we are getting to the point where within the next few weeks, we're anticipating more and more cases. Just how many cases exactly when that rush will occur, difficult to predict. Most cases of the coronavirus are mild and require no real medical attention, but there are those that will be critical. In that case, Northwestern has separated its ICU. One corridor of it will be just for COVID-19 patients. What we've done is shuffled how our beds are arranged to make a special area for patients who have COVID-19 and try to expand those resources. We're trying to free up as many ICU beds as possible across the hospital in anticipation that they could be filled. And Amanda, what will that treatment look like? At both of these hospitals, doctors will be treating coronavirus patients in protective gear. If you were a patient here, you would see a provider in a yellow gown, in gloves, they would have a mask on, and then some sort of eye protection as well to try to prevent the spread of this. Now that Northwestern doctor, Dr. Singer, is a pulmonary specialist who sees severe respiratory viral infections often from the flu, from pneumonia. He says coronavirus is particularly severe because of how infectious it is and how many cases hospitals suspect they will see at one time. In those critical cases, this is what treatment could look like. Many of our patients in the ICU will be on mechanical ventilators, be on life support machines. Again, these are the same types of life support that we would use for patients who uh, are not COVID-19 patients, right? So it would look very similar to other types of ICU care. Amanda, any takeaways for people who may have health issues that are not related to coronavirus? There definitely are. And again, got to reiterate that whatever the medical issue, you're very much encouraged to call a doctor or hospital before arriving there. Also, both Rush and Northwestern are proactively canceling elective surgeries. Now's a good time to hold off on those surgeries um, and try to postpone them a little bit until some of this clears because we really want to only have traffic in the hospital and people coming to the hospital that really need to be here at this point. Um, again, this social distancing and quarantining is really what's going to give us our best chance to not outpace the resources we have to be able to take care of the patients we need to take care of here. Many hospitals are also saying no to visitors. There are some exceptions, say a partner of someone in labor or maybe a caregiver, but by and large, stay away. They're also repeating that old advice, wash your hands. You see it there at Rush. Also, again, stay home if you are able to, sanitize often. That is especially good advice for healthcare professionals themselves. After all, they need to stay healthy so they can treat patients, Brandis. Of course, Amanda, thanks. We'll see you in a bit for Spotlight Politics. But first to Carol Marine with more recommendations to help stop the spread of the virus. Carol.
Brandis, the governor has closed restaurants and bars for dine-in business. Schools across the state are shuttering. As you just heard, some hospitals are postponing elective surgeries. And now President Trump and his coronavirus task force are recommending gatherings should be limited to 10 people a day after the CDC recommended limits of 50 people. The San Francisco area has gone farther, imposing a near lockdown with a shelter in place order for 7 million people. Illinois hasn't gone that far yet. So how much will the closings and recommendations here make a difference in stopping the spread of COVID-19 in Illinois? We are joined with some answers by Dr. Susan Bleasdale, an infectious disease physician, medical director of infection prevention and control at the University of Illinois Health. Welcome back to Chicago tonight, doctor. The Bay Area lockdown, if it's happening to them, are we going to be far behind? It's hard to say, you know, there's been stepwise measures, you know, the state puts out recommendations for parties of larger than 1,000 and 250, but it kind of depends on what's happening in the behaviors. We saw over the weekend that there were still large people gathering outside of um, bars and restaurants because of celebrations for the St. Patrick's Day weekend. And so I think then next came the, the, the closing of bars and restaurants. The idea is that we do need to be very aware of the recommendations to distance ourselves in some way to prevent transmission of infection so that we can try to control the spread. And so these have been stepwise, the, the 50 yesterday, the 10 today that was recommended um, uh, in addition, this is the way things are gonna proceed until we get, we get control of spread. It never hurts educationally to go through these symptoms one more time because this is not the flu, this is not an allergic reaction people are getting at this season. So our symptoms are basically what again? So it's typically respiratory symptoms. The hard part is that some of the first symptoms can be very mild. You know, it can be a runny nose, it can be a sore throat, it can be a mild cough. Um, sometimes people have muscle aches and headache associated with it. Sometimes people can have upset stomach or, or even diarrhea. But the, the hardest part and why the need for the social distancing is that as people are starting to get these symptoms, usually they wouldn't stay home, right? As they're starting to get ill, they might still go to work or still be in right. groups because they think, oh, I just have a mild cold. And that's why I think we need to really emphasize that people need to, to isolate themselves when they're developing these early symptoms. This social distancing though, I mean, I watched the president's news conference today. There he is at the podium, crammed behind him, including Dr. Fauci, are all of these people who are urging social distancing. The optics don't seem to conform always to the message, do they? No, but I would say this is hard. This is new for everyone, right? This, this idea of, of space, of not touching, of not handshaking for people that you meet, but even for people that you know and love, right? For people that are our are grandparents and, and are vulnerable people, you know, it's, it's, it's staying away. And so this is something new and, and I think different, and we are slowly adjusting to it, but it is, it, it's hard. Can people have dinner with their neighbors? or their kids. Let's kind of outline some of the pragmatic what ifs. What if you do that? I think the key is, and the idea of the social distancing is that you, you are avoiding groups where you don't know what the circumstances are. If you choose to engage with an activity with someone, one or two people in your neighborhood, in your community, you wanna make sure that you talk with them first. Make sure that they don't have any symptoms of a cold or anything coming on. Making sure that, that no one that's there could potentially be at risk. So someone that has an immune compromising condition or or is elderly, then they maybe should not be having dinner with someone else um, outside of their own home, right? That they should probably be isolating within their own home. But the idea is having a conversation. If your child is gonna get together with another child, talking to the parent, making sure the kids are aware, making sure you're encouraging hand hygiene often, you're discouraging touching of their faces, making sure when they're eating or snacking, you're washing hands. Simple things like, you know, you have a bowl of chips, that's probably not a good idea to have multiple hands digging into a bowl of chips because that's an opportunity for sharing um, and spreading infection. In the Aon building, somebody comes down with COVID-19. You're still working in the Aon building. Do you get in the elevator? Do you use the stairs? So it's typically, 
that this infection, it is very contagious, but it doesn't look like it persists in the environment or in the air like other respiratory things like measles or chicken pox that it can hang out in the air and puts even after the person's gone. In general, the risk is in close contact with someone with symptoms or someone that has symptoms that touches a commonly touched um, object. So I would say you're riding on the elevator, you should wash your hands after you get off the elevator because you're touching the buttons on the elevator. You should, in your home or in your work environment, make sure that you're disinfecting commonly touched surfaces like doorknobs, elevators, things like that. Interview desks. Interview desks Interview as desks. well. As I leave, you'll wipe off the desk. But I mean, all of those things you don't automatically think of. And then comes the question, how long does you know, people cough into their elbow? It lives in your elbow, right? Or are your clothes? And that was a recommendation before to try to contain cough. But I would say you shouldn't cough into your elbow. You should grab a tissue and cough into the tissue, throw the tissue out and wash your hands. It really is not a good idea to cough into your elbow because you're coughing on your elbow, right? Um, you should try to contain it, cover it, throw the tissue out and wash your hands. The, these big testing areas in parking lots we're seeing around the country where someone all uh, dressed in careful gear are taking the temperature of people. We don't have that in Illinois yet, do we? No, but I mean, I think there are some areas that have um, sort of mobile testing sites, but really the focus of testing is on the inpatient setting, right? It's people that need to be hospitalized, that's where our testing needs to be focused. And for those that are ill with a mild illness, it actually it's probably best that you just stay home and that you don't come to get tested but actually you, you stay home and you call your provider and see when you need to seek medical care um, so that's really where most of the focus is for us in Illinois and and at most of the medical centers um, nearby there is a question about how long this is going to go on the president today said it might go on into June or July is that your expectation so I think the the issue is that the, this infection is likely to go on for a prolonged period of time. Does this mean that we'll be in the sort of lockdown situation for that entire time? Maybe not necessarily. I think the CDC recommended yesterday eight weeks for this limitation to, to smaller groups. And then I think what we'll likely see is is hopefully at some point we'll have a, a decrease in the number of cases and that might control the, the onslaught into the medical system and able, enable the medical system to be able to function appropriately. And then these things may come back in a slow stepwise fashion. We kind of jumped in a stepwise fashion, but very quickly, we'll likely see these removed in a slower stepwise fashion. You're a physician, you're an expert on this. Has your own personal life changed because of COVID-19? It has. I, I have children. They, they were going to school. They're home from school right now. Um, there's questions about um, whether or not they can, you know, see their friends, talk to their friends. Um, it's, it, I'm a health care provider, so it's making sure that, that there's a, appropriate measures of protection when um, myself and other of my colleagues are seeing patients. It's, it's affecting everyone. It affects everyone's lifestyle right now in health care and out of, outside of health care. Dr. Susan Bleasdale, we are so glad that you're here and that you keep coming back. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Chicago Tonight and WTTW News are committed to bring your resource, for being your resource rather, for everything you need to know about this virus, both on air and online. So be sure to stay with us for the very latest. And you have questions about coronavirus that you'd like us to look into, send us them via Facebook or on Twitter using the hashtag Chicago Tonight. Up next, a look at the impact of the coronavirus and what it's doing on Wall Street and Main Street. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago tonight with the restaurant industry taking a hit across the country, a look at the economic impact of the coronavirus. Chicago election authorities issue a plea to voters. Our Spotlight Politics team tackles that story and many more. And in a brief respite from the anxieties of the day, we introduce you to the black ABCs. 
But first, Illinois restaurants and bars are preparing for their last call until at least the end of the month. Limited carryout and delivery service is still allowed. This after Governor Pritzker ordered the shutdown to stem the spread of coronavirus. Meanwhile, Illinois grocers, big and small, are scrambling to restock shelves after an onslaught of shoppers this weekend left them bare. Shoppers lined up outside the Lincoln Park Costco early this morning before doors opened, hoping to stock up on whatever the store had left. I have a 90-year-old mother that's in Northbrook that I have to, you know, watch out for, and I want to make sure that I have enough stuff for her for the next couple weeks. I'm hoping they're stocked up. I've seen a bunch of empty shelves at other grocery stores. We haven't been to Costco yet, but uh, yeah, hopefully they've got food in there. Costco and other stores are frantically trying to keep up with demand after rows and rows of empty shelves greeted customers all over the city last week. In Cicero, workers at the family-owned La Chiquita store were working since 4 a.m. to restock shelves. Store manager Martin Sandoval says he's calling in favors to suppliers to even get fractions of full orders. One vendor was able to give me 85%. Another vendor, I just got a phone call maybe a half hour ago, that they're, they're thinking maybe 15 to 20 percent of what I ordered I will get. And that's mostly dry goods. But Sandoval says there's a lot of uncertainty in the industry. They're giving us what they have right now. They don't know what they're going to they're gonna get. They don't know their supply chain, if it's going to be able to hold up for the demand. La Chiquita shopper Joanne Hinton says she had to call around before venturing to buy food. Yesterday I called Fresh Times in River Four. She had nothing. Went in Trader Joe's on Friday. The walls were bare. So I didn't come out Saturday or Sunday. So I called this morning. This grocery store came out and they said they had eggs and a few other items. Governor Pritzker says he is considering loosening regulations on the food supply chain if need be. But he is urging all shoppers only to buy what they need and not to hoard. Meanwhile, spokespeople for the Restaurant and Bar Association say their members are still trying to figure out how to comply with the new order. Bill Jacobs, owner of Peace Pizzeria and Brewery in Wicker Park, says he expects to lose 70 percent of his business during the shutdown, but he'll ramp up delivery and pickup services. We don't know how long this is going to go on for, so, you know, we're keeping our fingers crossed that you know, this thing will be out of, out of the system within a reasonable period of time, but we really don't know, and that's the scary part. Jacob says servers and bartenders will have to be furloughed with the hopes that they can return to work in two weeks. Hang in there. We're going to do everything we possibly can. Sam Toya, head of the Illinois Restaurant Association, says the situation is devastating for his members. He's calling on federal help to prevent mass layoffs and small restaurants going out of business. We need a bailout at the federal level. What the federal government did for banks in 2008, the federal government's got to do for the hospitality restaurants here throughout the country in 2020. Without it, he says, the economic impact of the coronavirus will long outlast the shutdown. And per new orders from Mayor Lori Lightfoot this evening, Chicago restaurants will be able to allow customers to walk in the establishment and carry out their order. Now, one small grocer told me his demand is five times greater than normal. Put quite simply, he says, we are in uncharted waters. And just how long will it take to navigate these uncharted waters? The Dow had another dismal day, closing down almost 3,000 points. That's nearly a 13% drop, the Dow's worst day since 1987. Joining us with their view of the broader economy, how long the bloodletting might last, and what it means on Main Street are... Michael Miller, Associate Professor of Economics at DePaul University, and Edward Stewart, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Northeastern Illinois University. Welcome back. We're sitting a few feet apart just for, pre for precautionary reasons. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something new. Uh, Mike Miller, 13% sell-off today. Where is the bottom for this market? Uh, when people finally uh, get the idea that the uh, virus has uh, bottomed out and the numbers of people infected is going to decline, and that's but weeks away. That could be weeks away. And what else is interesting is a lot of this is done as well on uh, algorithms. That one reason some of the people are selling is because somebody sold right before them. Kicks in an algorithm and it just becomes, uh, it cascades and becomes a, a chain reaction. Yep. Uh, Ed Stewart, what do you make of the Fed moves over the weekend? Interest rates down to around zero, $700 billion in quantitative easing. Yeah. It's to quote my logic philosophy professor, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And in fact, in these mm -hmm. kinds of situations where businesses and consumers are getting into cash, that's what's going on in Wall Street. Um, 
then what what the Fed does is essentially prevent the financial system from completely collapsing. But as far as reviving the business on Main Street, the Fed can't do that, right? Um, what has to be done is obviously fiscal policy, the kinds of things that the Restaurant Association had talked about, the aid to the restaurant industry, uh, supplemental uh, unemployment insurance, um, expanding food stamps and uh, unemployment benefits, um, all of those things need to be need to be done and need to be done quickly. And Mike Miller, you heard in in that piece, the restaurant sending uh, furloughing workers. They're right. going to go home without a paycheck. How many people are we talking about across the country? What are they supposed to do? That is the that's the issue. Is uh, we we need to always measure cost and benefits when we take these actions. I'm just hoping that the benefits outweigh the cost here because the people who are going to be hurt are not people like Ed and myself. We can make it the next couple of weeks, and I'm being paid at the university because I'm on salary. I'm concerned about the people who will not be able to make their, their rent at the end of the month. And we have, I don't know, I hope it isn't cavalierly decided we're going to close everything. I think adults could have made their own decisions. Uh, the Fed's doing something which is necessary, and that's provide liquidity so that the businesses themselves who want to go to cash or they draw upon an existing line of credit so they have cash, that's a good thing. But I'm fully in agreement with Ed the group that can help the people at the moment is the government as opposed to the Fed. All right, so, so specifically for the folks that live paycheck to paycheck or they're dealing with credit card debt or they have medical debt, student debt, what does the government need to do for them? Well, the Fed can do a couple of things with regard to credit. It yes. can tell credit card issuers and student debt loan holders to, to have some kind of a grace period, maybe for, like Mike says, as long as this virus poses a, a danger. But there are things that can be done for the ordinary household and you've got to remember 50 percent of the American public has no savings right? right they're net debtors so credit cards student loan auto loans uh, are very crucial uh, to kind of maybe give them some breathing room before they have to make regular payments all right well let's hear from President Trump he was asked whether the economy was headed into recession today here's how he responded well, it may be. We're not thinking in terms of recession. We're thinking in terms of the virus. Once we stop, I think there's a tremendous pent-up demand, both in terms of the stock market and in terms of the economy. And once this goes away, once it uh, goes through and we're done with it, I think you're going to see a tremendous, a tremendous surge. Mike Miller, do you agree with that, a big bounce back once this is over? I sure hope so. Uh, I, I, I was on just last week, and we talked about I, I was a bank economist whom I respect very much, who did not put negative numbers on his forecast for the coming quarters. Goldman Sachs has come out and said, we're going to go down big time in the uh, second quarter, maybe as much as 5%. But even Goldman Sachs, in their forecast, then uh, are looking for a bounce back very quickly. So, so we would have a relatively short period, maybe five months, of, of major decline. So in those five months of major decline, what does that mean in terms of layoffs? What does it mean in terms of the unemployment rate of businesses closing up? Yeah, the unemployment rate, which is around 3.5% right now, you could see going to, I'd say, 7 or 8%. And um, right after the show on Thursday, I got a message from one of my former students who works for one of the major banks here. And she said there, she's in the liquidity stress uh, program and she said they're already assuming recession conditions for their customers and the and the bank so my advice to people who can do it to put off this is going to hurt the economy but for the average person who's who's financially strapped you need to put off any kind of major purchase and and save your cash for food and basic necessities. And as we mentioned, we're at the beginning of this. I mean, shutdowns that begin tonight for That's two right. weeks, at least in Chicago, San Francisco, right. three-week lockdown. How does the market react to things like well, this? Well, what's interesting as well, it, the market, again, is based upon information. And as soon as that panic selling uh, gets out of the system, I think the market will finally stabilize. But what's interesting is the, the labor data come out. There uh, is a survey in the week that includes the 12th. Mm -hmm. And that was before things got really bad. Yeah. And next month, maybe things will be better. You know, a lot of those people who are going to be out of work for the next three weeks or something like that actually will be back to work. So we may not see this big increase in the unemployment rate unless it keeps, if, unless the president and his idea that we could be in this until summer, if that means we're going to be in a reduction of, of uh, hospitality and all that for months and months, we're in, and, the economy's in very deep trouble. And, and the president said that he's going to have the back of the airline industry, which could see bankruptcies mm -hmm. um, before this summer starts. 
should that industry be bailed out and sure. why just that industry should other industries well it's, follow? A, it's a it's a key industry and especially for for a place like Chicago um, I, I flew back from uh, visiting my mom last Tuesday and one of the United people on my plane said this is a worse demand cutback than after 9-11 and we don't want to have United and American and Delta go out of business because it's going to be much harder to rebuild that industry. But you heard the Restaurant Association spokesman saying okay if this the airlines or it was the banks in 2008 right. and it was the audio and auto industry after why not our industry. Yeah. Yeah. See that's one of the problems you don't want government picking winners and losers. And, and even in something like uh, with United, I was, we actually have a, uh, an MBA with United, and a bunch of my students just this past quarter were, uh, were, were affecting, their whole lives were affected by this, and they don't know what's going to happen the next day. They were working 12 and 14 hours to try, because they're in the center of everything. They're trying to figure out, are they going to be here tomorrow? Would they even be needed? And this kind of uncertainty creates a lot of problem in people's lives. Well, if you see a bailout like this of, of big corporations like the airlines, is there a populist revolt uh, on the horizon saying, well, what about student debt and what about medical debt and what about credit card debt? Yeah, it has to be, it has to be micro in some sense, key industries like the transportation and hospitality industry, but it also has to be macro so that everybody realizes that we're in this together and unemployment insurance. Something like a big yeah. stimulus right. after 2008. Yes, exactly. Well, Senator Mitt Romney today was talking about $1,000 uh, in just universal basic income to every adult. What about that? I'd, I'd have to take a look at what he has in mind there. Just like a lot of people think that if you would cut the Social Security taxes, the president has, has thought, that would be good for those who keep their job. It would also be good for small businesses, wouldn't have to pay their half of the Social Security because it's for both sides, not just the worker side. That could actually be a very good thing for these small businesses. So it could be that a tax cut would be a better job, a better thing than to just give people like me and Ed $1,000. What, I don't need $1,000. I'd rather give $2,000 to somebody who does need the money. I, I think we need to err on the side of doing too much rather than doing too little. After the 07-09 Great Recession, one of the things that was, that was particularly advantageous about the stimulus package is it had seven or eight different components. So there's not going to be one thing that solves the problem or even two or three. We have to have a whole catalog of programs that target some industries but then also help the general economy so giving a thousand dollars to everybody I think might be a good idea so at what time do we talk about the trillion dollar national deficit and we talk about the endless pension debt in Illinois and in mm. Chicago what's the final tab gonna be uh, the final tab could be trillions but you don't worry about the national debt in a time of national emergency just like you wouldn't during World War two we had a national debt was 125 percent of GDP you don't worry about a few you know billion dollars back then if you're fighting a war uh, this is almost like a war to protect the country and so I'm not worried at all about deficits we'll deal with those later on all right Mike Miller Ed Stewart thank you as always you're welcome stay healthy and up next, Chicago election officials issue a plea to voters in advance of tomorrow's primary. That and more in a special pre-election edition of Spotlight Politics. So please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd. Powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> The ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Pedal faster! Illinois is one day away from the state's primary election and local officials, election officials, are calling the situation, quote, untenable. Coronavirus fears have wreaked havoc on the system, leading to the last minute movement of polling places and a serious shortage of election judges. Chicago's election board chairman issued a plea to all who would listen today. The election is the focus of tonight's special edition of Spotlight Politics with our political team of Amanda Vinicky.
There she is. Nope, that's not her. That's me. Amanda <laughs> Vinicky. She's here. I promise. There she is. Paris shuts. Far away. We're far away from each other. And Carol Marine. Well, yes. So I, we should probably reference. This is a little weird for us as well, but we are practicing some social distancing. We are trying to heed the advice of public health officials. Um, we like each other, but not enough to spread uh, no. any illness. So, um, so we're talking about the Chicago Board of Elections, about the concerns with not having enough judges tomorrow. Paris, what is the problem there? Well, election officials are frantic, Brandis. I've never seen them like this. And they won't say it, but they were implying this in their comments. They don't think the election should go forward tomorrow, but they, it will go forward tomorrow. They don't have a say in it. They have to carry it out. Polling places are dropping out because they were in nursing homes and schools or landlords saying we don't want people coming in here. They don't have any judges. I mean, judges are dropping out because they don't want to sit there and be exposed to virus. And judges are the people that make sure that you're registered, go send you on your way to vote, and then go tabulate the results. They're literally saying if you're able-bodied, come in and be a judge, and you can just be sworn in on the spot, even though normally it takes four hours of training to be a judge. It's it's a very dire situation, they're saying. They're trying to pull it all together. We'll wait and see what and happens. This is a way well. to make a buck, we should mention, for all of those who are hurting, who are out of work. Of course, restaurants and bars, as we've heard and talked about, will be closing in just a matter of hours for dining customers. You can make about 200 bucks or so. 70 bucks a day yeah. and I think they're willing to, to prorate it for you. Yeah. Um, Carol, I want to bring it over to you. You've been in touch with the Board of Elections uh, within the last few hours just before we came on the air tonight. It's getting worse over the course of the day. Yes, it is. Uh, in just the last hour, eight precincts in the 26th Ward bit the dust. Why? Because landlords who have those machines right now in their properties are saying to the board, get them out of here. Coronavirus, whatever, I don't want it anymore. And can I just say, I was a judge of election. I took the training just out of curiosity uh, a few years ago. And I'm here to tell you, you can recruit people right off the street, but it takes some knowledge and some skill to know how to set up those touch machines, how to deal with the paper ballots, how to talk to downtown. There's a lot to it. Okay, so um, Paris, you said that they were all but, you know, implying moving the election date. I think we've heard the governor address this. Amanda, what has the governor said about moving the election day? So the governor has been steadfast in saying, no, the election is not going to move. And in fact, reporters asked about it today. This was he's been holding these daily briefings on the coronavirus. This was the first one that he held downstate because certainly I have seen on social media, just hearing from viewers, they're saying, why isn't he pushing this back when you say that you shouldn't have events with 50 people? This makes no sense. He said, there are several reasons. First of all, we don't know, and that's what, of course, makes this so, you know, filled with anxiety for folks, is that we don't know when this is going to end. So he says you need to elect officials even in difficult times. It's not as if people are hanging out during elections. There will be sanitization efforts in effect. And further, it is difficult as we're seeing play out in Ohio for elections to be moved, particularly at this quick a time it would take either a law or a court order. Right. He, could, he could have done that, there's, but we're not seeing that. There's no stipulation in Illinois law for this situation. They'd be out operating outside the law if they decided to postpone the election. And he noted that there have been a lot of people who've already cast their votes early and by mail. And so this is sort of your education there that you still have an opportunity to do it. If you requested a mail in ballot, you can have that in through tomorrow, through election day, just has to be postmarked by then. And there's this new tracking system. They're scanned sort of like a package that you would get from Amazon. So you can still put that in the mail. But of course, early voting now is over. We did see a record number of people take advantage of that. Now, Paris, how are campaigns handling this? Well, I mean, they shut the Biden and Sanders, shut down any public events, no going knocking on doors. Uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia is leading the the uh, by the Sanders uh, effort in Illinois, and it's a lot of phone banking. I mean, that's what they're doing now to get out the vote. They all want to get out to vote, although the vote will probably be suppressed tomorrow. Does that um, benefit Sanders or Biden? I don't think so. I mean, the polling shows that Biden has a pretty comfortable 20-point lead, if we're to believe those polls. Biden does really well with African-American and older voters. Sanders with younger voters and Hispanic mirroring the national trends. But even down ballot races where typically you're trying to get, say if you're running, you know, it's impossible. Biden and Sanders aren't going to be go knocking on door to door. Instead, they've held teletown halls. It may have hurt their fundraising because you can't have those, you know, smaller schmoozing <laughs> events with people with deep pockets. But in some of those down ballot races where it's face to face interaction, of course, we're all discouraged from having any of those face to face interactions. So they're trying to go digital too. But Shaking will that hurt? 
encourage. Yes, exactly. But of course, that could, as Paris noted, hurt voter turnout. Now, Carol, so we have seen Governor Pritzker and Mayor Lightfoot out front on this crisis quite a bit, sometimes together, sometimes they are not. Uh, how would you say they are handling this crisis? They seem to be handling it well and handling it with each other. Whatever disagreements exist, and I'm told there are some, they've managed to work them out before they come out in front of the cameras. So it's a united front, and they seem to have, have understood each other very well. Clearly Pritzker's pleas over the weekend over Twitter to President Trump and Vice President Pence to figure out the situation at Customs at O'Hare worked. Later that night, the acting Homeland Security had talked about adding more staffing. It looks like those lines went down. So Pritzker, I've never seen, you know, he's a guy that's usually pretty controlled and he's using the S word you know, with some characters on Twitter, and it seemed Not to get real. people's uh, attention. I mean, and I will say also that there was some sort of speculation. How far apart are the mayor and the governor on some of these actions? Because you, you sort of saw, for example, first the mayor say, OK, we're not going to have any more than 100 people or half of capacity at bars at one point during the day. And then later in the day, the governor enacting the ban of all dining in at restaurants and bars. Same with schools. Originally, it was going to be that no CPS wasn't going to close. And then you had a statewide requirement that all schools close starting tomorrow, but both of them have said that no, don't make too much of this. Yes, we disagree, but this is a difficult thing. There are no easy decisions. So as Carol noted, it is a united front. Uh, we, however, are, are watching that because these are two very powerful people. And it's also, it, it could also be a matter of each of them having a different uh, population to consider. Sure. The mayor has said as much last week uh, that the governor has the state to consider, and obviously she has the folks uh, in the city of Chicago to consider. Um, but tomorrow, so Illinoisans are going to cast their ballots uh, for the presidential candidates tomorrow. Uh, governor Pritzker has endorsed uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. Paris, what difference do you think that will make for him? I don't think it makes any difference. I mean, Joe Biden has uh, every big public Democrat in Illinois, the two senators, Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Uh, I mean, if you believe the polls, again, you know, Biden has all the momentum because of what's happened over the last two weeks. Carol? She doesn't need to, uh, if you're talking about Lori Lightfoot, um, endorse and, and Pritzker's endorsement, I agree with Paris, doesn't make any difference particularly. This isn't Senator James Clyburn in South Carolina, who arguably was the pivot point in that election. Uh, right now, this is a blue state. Uh, Biden's got a lot of friends here. I, I don't think an endorsement matters at all. And Carol, what did you make of last night's Democratic debate? This one was the first one uh, since the field had been narrowed down to uh, just uh, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Oh, Brandis, I think that we should have more debates with no audiences. I thought, I didn't think I'd stick for the whole two hours and I'm a political junkie, but I did. And what I saw was Joe Biden looking a bit more presidential, but Bernie Sanders looking a bit more vital. And so there was a contrast. Each one had a gaffe or two, but it was two hours you could actually listen to. <sighs> okay, so just last week, right here, we had the Cook County State's Attorney Forum. Uh, four candidates were here sitting at this desk. First, let's take a look at how they handled the Jussie Smollett case. That the attention on a nonviolent, low level offense for almost a year, dominating the conversation when, not to say that people shouldn't care about it, but the attention, the millions of dollars that have gone behind trying to keep this at the forefront while not addressing the other issues of our criminal justice system seems disingenuous. I, I think that what the issue is, is that this case was indicted, 16 counts, three weeks later it's dropped, and we never heard from Kim Fox about why the case was dropped. A special prosecutor determined that there was evidence to indict the case, and the second part of his determination is whether or not there was wrongdoing on the part of the state's attorney. Before the special prosecutor was appointed, Ms. Fox could have stood up and told us all in Cook County why those charges were dropped. And instead, she's facing down potential criminal wrongdoing. Mr. Conway, yeah. is it disingenuous to focus so much on one case uh, and not on thousands of other cases being prosecuted? This is, a, you know, you can't have a two-tier criminal justice system because you can't have criminal justice perform when the politically connected get one deal and other people get another. Paris, your hands were full with that bunch last week. How do still you think recovering. they came off? Well, you know, Kim Fox still has not really answered these questions. Instead, she's pivoted toward 
you know, saying that this is a distraction, that this uh, is, uh, we should be focusing on all the other problems that the state's attorney has to deal with. And I think that's been an effective message uh, to some degree because her polling numbers look fairly good. And I think those other candidates were aware of those polling numbers because it seemed like there were a lot of last gasps for them to try and sully Kim Fox. And then from the two others, Moore and Fioretti, to sully Mr. Conway, who's gotten upwards of $11 million from his father, who he, he was really trying to, to tar uh, Kim Fox. Kim Fox kind of laid back, took the fire, and, and didn't engage so much. That's the look of someone that believes that they're ahead. Carol, what's your read on that forum? I think that though Conway um, has poured tons of his dad's money into this campaign, those other three besides Kim Fox are going to divide up the vote. And her base of, of Hispanics and blacks are deeply concerned about a criminal justice system where they see more of their own people in jail. And so um, I think Kim Fox did what uh, seems like a front runner has to do, which is listen to it and let it roll off. Okay, so uh, candidates also discussed bail reform. Um, there's, uh, we've got a little bit of that discussion as well. We should use pretrial detention to keep violent criminals behind bars, use common sense to give those that need bail, and we can all agree that low-level offenses with nobody with backgrounds should not have uh, Ms. That. Ms. Fox, I have to give Absolutely. you a chance to respond to this. I certainly hope that uh, my opponents know that judges set bail, not the state's attorney. I also hope that they know that we were under a federal consent decree for 40 years for overcrowding. The fact of the matter is, is that bail reform was long overdue in Cook County. I believe, and I believe the other stakeholders in the justice system believe, uh, that violent offenders should not be released pretrial. I remind people that Jason Van Dyke was charged with the murder of Laquan McDonald and was allowed to sit his case at home because someone posted $100,000. Someone charged with murder. I think at the we same all time, agree that Jason Van Dyke three, should have been held. Three and a half years ago, we sat here with, with Phil Ponce, and Phil Ponce asked Ms. Fox about her lack of experience for this job, and Ms. Fox said, it's not about experience, it's about judgment. And the last three and a half years, we have seen that she doesn't have the judgment for this job. Carol, do you think voters will buy into or agree with what Donna Moore just said about Kim Fox? You know, I think that um, voters are pretty well set on this, and I think they will divide up in terms of black and Hispanic versus some perhaps white suburban voters. Um, it, there could be a surprise, don't get me wrong, Brandis, but I think I would be surprised if Kim Fox didn't make it out of this well. And let's not forget, this is a referendum, and this is going on across the country with prosecutors on a more progressive style of prosecuting where you don't overly prosecute low-level offenders, especially if they're poor. You don't make them sit in jail. You send them to diversion programs, drug courts, and try to rehabilitate them. If Kim Fox wins resoundingly, it's a resounding endorsement for that style of prosecution. Even though all of these candidates are sort of a and they're sort of saying, on, on, we believe in that, too. That. Right. I think another thing that we're really going to have to watch tomorrow is, is it a, a referendum on that? And again, how much is all that is going on with the coronavirus, with turnout or potentially lack thereof, going to change things? What, what is it going to say about any of the results? Amanda, what are some of the other big races that you're watching tomorrow? Ooh, there are, I mean, again, everybody's looking for, at the presidential, of course. We will be too, but there are plenty of other races, starting with the Illinois Supreme Court. I've done a couple of stories on that. Again, that is a 10-year term, and then once you get it, it is pretty darn easy to hold on to that seat. So it is certainly significant. There are a couple of them, but one for Cook County voters where they're going to get to decide. Also, there's, of course, Congress. I'm, I think Paris wants to touch on that, so I will skip real quick while, while I've got the forum to also mention some competitive seats, particularly in the legislature, really looking at the Illinois House, where we've seen a lot of turnover in the General Assembly. And while there are some cases that are going to be competitive in the general election, there are a bunch that are really going to be competitive only in the primary. So you're looking at, for example, um, former state representative Sarah Feigenholtz, her seat, where you have two individuals. One is backed by the governor. The other is backed by the mayor. You're also looking at former representative Luis Arroyo, who, of course, had to leave when he was ousted in this corruption scandal and bribery. 
his replacement. There are those in the legislature that say she got there through inappropriate means that Arroyo had a hand in. So there, there's a whole we lot. Get, I don't Check think we're going to get to the Okay, so six in the 14th congressional districts, two suburban districts that went from red to blue two years ago. Republicans are trying to win those back. Sean Caston, the incumbent in the sixth, Lauren Underwood in the 14th, and the third, Dan Lipinski, a moderate Democrat, facing another challenge from his left. Okay, Carol. I know you're watching the big races, too. We're going to talk about them on Wednesday. All right. Our deal. Thought, my thanks to the Spotlight Politics team. And make sure to visit our website for our voter guide to the primary election, which has more information on candidates and races. And you can find the guide at WTTW.com slash voter guide. Up next, a look at an anniversary celebration of the black ABCs. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. In the midst of cancellations and closures, an art exhibit actually remains open, but for a limited time, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Black ABCs. Since the 1970s, these letters have been used in public schools around the country, helping students learn how to read. The photos for those learning images were taken of children here in Chicago. Arts correspondent Angel Edo caught up with some of those children as they marked the anniversary with a new series of portraits. Imagine you're just watching TV one afternoon, nothing out of the ordinary, and suddenly you see a photo of yourself as a child. I was watching a TV program in the 90s and Tupac was interviewing in a school and the letters were behind him as he gives the interview. And I'm like, and he was in California and I was like, these letters have reached the West Coast all the way over there. And that's when it came to me like, wow, those things, those letters do have an effect, an effect on people and they're still valuable to that day. The letters Kevin Williams is talking about are the black ABCs. Created in the 1970s by two Chicago teachers, the letters were meant to give African-American students learning materials that was more reflective of their community. The letters started in Chicago public schools before circulating nationally and now online. This year, the Black ABCs are celebrating 50 years with an exhibit at the University of Chicago's Arts Incubator called S is for Soul Sister. The exhibit features portraits of Williams and some of his peers with an audio element that allows visitors to listen to each person recall the day their photo was taken. The backdrop of their portraits feature an artistic representation of their own cells, which were swabbed from their cheeks on the day of the photo shoot. The goal was to utilize the subject's own cells that were taken at the time of their, uh, the, their um, narratives. So they were speaking into microphone um, in the studio, and I was shooting them. And then at the end of that, while they, you know, after they had given their narratives, I then took the cells in. So I thought that that was also a very important and powerful statement. You know, you're taking cells at the time that they're giving their, their truth, so to speak. And, and, you know, the same, same token visually then using their own cells as a means of amplifying their own stories. Cheryl Reese, who posed for the letter T, says community is an important element of their narratives. As children, we grew up in the Harold Ickes projects, and Kevin can attest to this, we all went to the Henry Booth house for preschool. The letter X, which is Shannon Moore, Reginald Corners is R. All of our mothers kind of knew each other. And then not only did we go from preschool, this is kind of like preschool, grammar school, and high school. Oh, wow. So we've known each other throughout all those different uh, institutions. Wow. So yes, 
Kevin, who is now a comedian, has always been funny, okay? <laughs> Never did the kids think that the photos they took one fun afternoon would still be used today. We made history. I mean, you know, the whole intent was to inspire African-American children through representation in an educational medium. I would like to see a resurgence of these alphabets in the public school system. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. The black ABCs were original, originally set to be displayed at the University of Chicago's Arts and Public Life Arts Incubator until late March, but it'll now close this Wednesday with viewing hours available from 12 to 6. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Election Day arrives in Illinois. We'll have the latest on the race for president, state's attorney, and more. And much more on the local and national impact of the coronavirus pandemic. And now for all of us, and please follow our continuing coverage online at WTTW.com slash coronavirus. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I am Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.